what's the difference between God's perfect will and God's permissible will and how you can walk in the will of God inside of your life. Welcome to God's Business, where I interview the top Christian entrepreneurs, influencers, and thought leaders so that you can build not just a good business, but God's business, where he's the multiplier of your success. And in today's episode, we really get deep down into what is the difference of the permissible will of God, the things that he allows you to do, and the perfect will of God, and what does it look like? How do you discern how to hear his voice? And what does your life actually look like when you walk inside of that will of God? and the power of God on the earth inside of your marriage, inside of your relationship, and inside of your business. The friend that I brought in to really explain this is someone that has brought financial freedom to tons of people inside of a direct sales team into a marketing style company where he works with people, helping them build the systems, the automations, the lead gens, and has built a phenomenal seven-figure business doing so with his wife where they've traveled a ton, been planted in church, and tells the difference of those two lives and how you can implement the will of God inside of your life and inside of your business and family. Welcome my friend, Zachary Spear. Zach, what's up, man? Welcome to the God's Business Podcast. What's up, man? Thanks for having me, bro. I appreciate it. Yeah, dude, for people that don't know, we've known each other for a good amount of time. You were a traveling nomad at the time. You came out to Temecula, California and decided to rent an Airbnb and, you know, we selfishly tried to push you to, to join us on the California train. It didn't end up, the train got derailed a little bit. It I'm did not end well. Texas. It's, a, it's actually a sore subject now that I get into it. So, but you're out there in Southern California. You're loving it now. Married. Your second kid's going to be born when? Like a couple of weeks. He could be born, born during this podcast. Uh, I mean... It, he is, he could pop out anytime. So he's on the way. And, and so what's, what's your wife doing then right now? Like feet up, is she walking? Is she trying to get him, get the, get the baby out? Like, what's that yeah, no, she's not trying yet. She's not, she's not doing the walking stuff or the, or the feet up yet, but his due date is technically in five days. But I mean, you know how it is. Uh, they can come right now or a couple early. A week after that. How, how is that with, cause she works inside of the company for people that don't know what's her role in your guys's company. So she, um, she, it's changed a lot since we had our first kid, but I do, I don't want to gloss over the fact, um, that the, of the sore subject, um, which, uh, yeah. So Nicholas <laughs> d completely sold me. I literally remember, uh, we were doing nomadic thing. We had spent four months in four and a half months in Asia. We had just came back. I was two days off the plane. So super jet lagged. It's like 9 PM California time. And it's, uh, you know, whatever time that is where we were. But anyway, I'm all jacked up <clears throat> and, uh, and me and Nicholas are talking, me and you are talking about moving where to move to. Right. And you've made this airtight case on moving to California. <laughs> like it was beautiful. It was so, for those of you guys that don't know, like Nicholas is an amazing sales guy. And so he basically airtights me into California. I'm like, yeah, he's hundred percent. Right. We then get an Airbnb in the same town that Nicholas and Amanda live in. And, um, and, uh, and, and Amanda's dad. So she, he, I'm like, I'm like, Chris, it was actually at Kingston's baby shower. And, uh, and I'm like, Chris, tell me about Temecula, California, all of it. Right. And he's like, I'm never forget. He said these exact words. He said, I love it so much Zach. I will never leave California. <laughs> he said those exact words. I think within like within a year, for sure, you all were gone. <clears throat> Everyone left and we had moved to California. We had got a place and, uh, and you guys had left. So yeah, I'm, I'm still sad that you guys are gone. Cause I, I'll be, obviously, was I wrong though? No, you, no, you was definitely made a great case. Um, it was great. It was great. You were totally right. And, uh, we love it here. You guys got connected to an awesome church there. We got connected. you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have been connected to awaken, right? No, z well, zero chance. Well, we would have, we actually already were at, we had gotten invited to an event that our church called awaken um, did, we got invited to emerge to the men's event. Um, so we were actually connected, but we, it's not, I would say it was, it, you probably had a very heavy role in having us like root down. Um, and then of course, well, Amanda, not, not, not just the church. I just mean, if you weren't in the area, you wouldn't have gone, right. You would have moved somewhere else or kept, yeah. you know, kept traveling. Yeah. No doubt. You know, no doubt. The travel guy, maybe, no maybe not even had kids, you know, like I didn't understand. Right. Totally. We could have been heathens. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Fell in, falling away from the faith. If you didn't come out there, true. like 
just downhill for pro- just regression. Um, yeah, absolutely. But no, it's really good. To your point, we we got connected to an amazing church out here. Um, when we were overseas, <clears throat> a lot of people would ask where we're from, and uh, and most people didn't expect Americans in some of the places we were in. So they would always guess places of Europe and things like that. And they finally like their last guess was America. And we, you know, yeah. And they're like, oh, where, where in America? And I would just say, well, why don't you guess? And they would say, they'd always answer one of two areas primarily. They would say California or New York. And occasionally they might guess Chicago, which is where we really were from. And it occurred to us after a few months that um, these massive centers of influence were California, New York, obviously Austin, where you guys are at is a huge epicenter of influence. Um, but when we were overseas, we really felt like when we came back, from however long we were going to be gone, that we wanted to root down in a place that number one was in Chicago because we did that we did our time, um, but two where where God was calling us and where we could have a leveraged impact on the kingdom, um, and so you know that just kind of kept pointing us back to California. There's so much beauty here, but ironically, there's a lot of corruption here, which is kind of interesting. How there's like this twisted, gorgeous, physical, beautiful, beautiful place, and it's been twisted in this ugly spiritual place. Um, and we really felt like we were supposed to go into like this enemy territory, so to speak, and, and, uh, and build the church. And then we found where we're at now. So, yeah, I got two questions on that. So one is, and keep me on this. I, w- I want to go back to the difference between when you were traveling, you can't really be planted in anything like you're, you're traveling. And so not being planted in church compared to being planted and you probably have experienced both. So some people voluntarily unplant themselves. And so I, I want to talk about that. So let's not go back. Let's not get too far off that. But before that, I think it's interesting what you talked about with just being outside of Chicago. So even leaving Temecula, which Temecula is great. Like I I just always want to be a promoter cross racer. So it was always kind of like this thing that I wanted to be in that city because I saw everyone that I looked up to come from that city, from the sport that I wanted to come from. Yet now that I've left and then I go back, I go, I don't think I'd leave, live there. How do I live in this like little tiny space in between this city and this city and and so it was kind of the same thing that you're able to get out of america and out of your current environment they say most people don't move outside of 20 miles of where they grew up the majority of people live within that 20 mile radius and you have these biases i had biases about temecula or california that everyone told me i had but i didn't it didn't actually listen to them and after I got out of it just a little bit, and I'm about to go to Asia as well for three weeks. So I'm getting out of it. I'm going to see a whole different environment and then come back. How important was that for you to get uprooted from your normality and society and your current like socioeconomic environment of where you grew up and just completely leave it and then come back with a whole new perspective on America, where you wanted to live, where you wanted to plant yourself? What was that like? Yeah, dude. Great question. And it was absolutely amazing. Um, I was super apprehensive to doing it. Ashley was the kind of like the, I call her the gypsy. You know, she was the one that wanted to, wanted to try it. I wanted to get it. She had already done some traveling before we met. And one day she was kind of floating the idea by me. And at the time our business was, was locally based. So like we couldn't really leave that easily. We had started to transition to an online business. And so kind of as our income went online, not local, um, it became a reality. Like we could actually do this and, you know, no thanks to me, but at that time, thanks to Ashley, she had made a lot of good financial choices before our marriage. And so we had some safety net thanks to her again, not thanks to me. Um, and so we had the safety net and then the business that I was running was online at that time. And we were making enough to, to live on. And, um, and Ashley's like, well, would you do it? And I was like, yeah, sure. I was kind of just like, yeah, sure. Whatever. Not thinking how serious this was. And a few days later, she's like, well, I pulled up this Airbnb in Bali and uh, she's like about to click do it, you know. And so she does. <clears throat> she talks to me and she she books the Airbnb for a month. And I'm like, holy crap, like this is real. And so we did the thing, right? We put everything in storage. We all that kind of stuff, all the logistics. And we went. And I remember it, at first I was like, I was so like, I was like homesick. I just felt terrible about it. Um, we were in, I remember landing in Bali and I was, I just felt like just awful, just like the super uncomfortable, right? You're just in a new, a new, a new thing. And after a few weeks I got over it 
And then after a few months, like my brain started to shift and rewire. And yeah, like you said, I mean, just having a totally fresh perspective on our country, um, on America, um, having a totally fresh perspective on like who I am, like uh, there is a lot of truth to what you said about getting uprooted. And there was, um, we definitely felt we needed to drive roots down when after we did about a year of this. Because you guys were, were you guys planted in a church when you guys got married where you were locally? We were, yeah. Yeah. So we cool. kind of so you're planted in the church. You left everything, which again, to some extent, there's pros and cons, but there's pros to get out of your hometown, like get, get a fresh perspective, get out of your own business, like yeah. take some time away from it for a second so you can look at it differently, like, or else you're going to be stuck in the weeds of everything all the time. We need those fresh perspectives. You guys go to Bali. What other places did you guys live and for how long were you guys traveling? So we did, we did Bali. Um, we did KL, which I think you're going to KL, uh, next, uh, you, how long do you guys live there? Why didn't you not give me like the lowdown? We were there for, I think a month and a half. Uh, we actually went there twice. Oh, okay. So, so we did, not uh, too, not too long. Did, no, yeah, it was, it was, I think we did a month. We went back to Bali for surf lessons and we went back to KL because we actually met somebody that, uh, gave us their penthouse for, for two weeks, which was really cool. Um, but yeah, so we did that. We did Iceland. We did Thailand. Um, and then we did about six months in the United States doing different spots in the U.S. And, oh, and then Mexico City. Um, so what we learned, I mean, what you learn about yourself is like you're able to like separate from your preconceived notions of how you think your business operates and how you think your world operates. And it's such a growth opportunity. I would highly recommend everyone do it. Um if they can, you know, at least leave for us for a little while. But then after, after a year you do for us, I mean, we, we did feel like, man, we need to draw, we need to like drive roots down again because you don't really realize this, but um, we, everywhere we went, we wanted to live in the culture we were going. So we didn't get, um, you know, the crazy resorts or anything. We lived in very nice places, but they're always like local to the area. So we lived in like a beautiful place in a local area in Bali. And we tried to do as many local things as we could do, not like, the Ritz and that kind of stuff. And it was a purposeful. Um, but one of the things that you do when you do that is you're like, you have to quit. <laughs> we take a lot of things for granted, like logistics, like where am I going to do my laundry this week? <laughs> like you got laundry's got to get done. Right. And of course you can just pay someone to get it done. And sometimes that works, but sometimes you can't, you know, you go to certain places and parts of the world and you can't just say, Hey, you know, hotel keeper, do my laundry. And so you're spending like 20%, 30% of your mental Ram, like just surviving which is pretty funny. And uh, so that kind of thing is pretty interesting, but I think you asked what, another What question. was your favorite spot out of all, all the places you guys went? Where did you like the most? Bali. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's think, that good, huh? Like I have the opportunity to go there, obviously, because because talking Malaysia, KL, Kuala Lumpur, however you say it, not American, but that's the American in me saying it. But Bali's like, what, like an hour plane flight or maybe a little yeah. bit more? I don't know. I think it's like an hour, so hour and a half. Nothing. It's very short, whatever it is. Um, yeah, so I, I have the opportunity, but that's like very close. It's it's that cool, huh? Like you feel like there's no like snakes all over your place and all that. Kind of stuff. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, no, so so here's what I would do if I were to, for anyone thinking about Bali or you going to Bali, um, it's it, for me, it's the best place I would live. I don't, it's not necessarily the best place to visit for, uh, you know, two days, although it's cool. I mean, you might be underwhelmed if you went for two days. I think it's the best place. If we were to live in another country, where would we choose out of the places we've been? Wow. I would say Bali. And I would stay away from the beach towns. Um, so like Changu and Kuta and those different places where a lot of people like us like to go. And I would go into the center, more of the center of the country, which is, the main city that's really popular is called Ubud. And um, you basically get away from a lot of the kind of the, the traveling riffraff and uh, a lot of the stuff that just follows like not the highest quality tourism. Um, but definitely a place that I would consider, I would for sure live there. If we weren't as rooted as we are in our church and we didn't feel like we were doing what we were supposed to do, like God's design plan for us um, in the church here in San Diego, I think there's a high probability we would live in Bali. Crazy. And then I heard Thailand's like super inexpensive. I haven't been, oh but I heard like it's, we have the opportunity to go there as well. I don't, I don't think we're going to, 
but I heard it's just unreally like Dude. how inexpensive things are. You would, it would blow your mind how true that is. Like we were making like so much less back then and we were living really, 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 really well. If you took like what you earn in America, like, <laughs> and you went to Thailand or Bali where you would be a Pharaoh. Um, like to, to, to give you an idea of like the Thailand, I mean, both Bali's really, really cheap too, but Thailand's even cheaper. Um, we would, we would budget like $15 US dollars a day. And we would eat out two times a day at restaurants, like actual restaurants with servers, nice places, stuff like that. Two times a day, both of us would eat. We'd both get a drink. Um, and we would get like a coffee or some sort of drink out. And that all of that would be $15 or less um, per day for both of us. That's crazy. I feel like KL is going to be like, like, I, I don't know if we'll know it. We're obviously going to be there with our friends. So they'll know. But most of the things I looked up, they're kind of like American things that are there and they're pretty much the same price. I'm like, oh, like that's that's basically like the same thing. Like if you were to go to like a nice steakhouse, I'm like, oh, I've heard this place before in America. Yeah, so it's kind of just the same thing. But I know that it's still less than here. Did you, did you guys have a good experience there as well? Just and this one's just for me. So I'm like, huh? yeah, you know, like, yeah. there's a lot of good cafes, bro. I looked them up. I was like, bro, yes, like, we're right there. And like the center of everything sure. similar experience like nice penthouse like two-story penthouse actually yeah so two floors like 6,500 square feet that's amazing yeah that's like that's it like doug's place uh, I'm sure. yeah it's basically doug's place in in malaysia and yeah. and i looked up cafes and i was like there's cafes everywhere like latte art like the goods yeah. like, let's go you know me so i'm like all about it Dude, did you guys gonna... find it was it was it a lot was it cheaper than America as well when you went there? Yeah, there's like two sides to KL. So there is like the local side and then there's like where all the expats go, like people like, you know, like me and you. Um, and so there is definitely a lot of spots that are super, you know, American prices, right? You know, if it's, let's say $300 for a meal for you and Amanda um, out here at a steakhouse, it'll be 280 there. Um, but then it, if you just kind of venture out just a little bit and, and, you know, obviously Peng, Peng will know, um, you know, like it's, it's a fall off dude. Um, like you can get lunch for like a dollar, uh, like <laughs> and a good one too. I can imagine bro. It's, That's it's, why I need him. Cause I'm like too afraid to like, I don't want to get jacked up there, or eat something that I shouldn't. So I'm like, oh, oh yeah, you might get, they call it Bali belly. It's when you eat their, the local cuisine, which is. It's like fried rice and fried noodles. It's basically like noodles and rice fried and who knows what. And um, and a lot of times you don't get affected, but like me and Ashley both got it for sure. And uh, it's what what is that? What's Bali Belly? What's that? It's just like extreme levels of diarrhea from uh from eating. <laughs> oh, I don't want that at all. That sounds <laughs> terrible. Yeah, for uh, sure. Yeah, I I don't think we'll do it, but I also don't want to just eat American. You know the two. I would argue that's the tourist. Like I would love to go there and ball out for nothing. Like that'd just be so cool. Right. Just to be like, man, like that I'm not feeling like I'm just going to America. Like we have date night tonight, you know, and it's like, it's America, you know, it's yeah. America, Austin, Austin's next level as well, man. Services even it's pretty next level when it comes to investment for service stuff yeah. way more than, than, than San Diego. Cause San Diego has so much competition, but here, it's not the same. You'll be like rolling up. You're like, I need my sprinklers adjusted. And the dude rolls up in like a brand new F-250. And you're like, uh -oh. Hold on a second. Uh-oh. Yeah. Turn turn away. Turn away. He's like, turn that's going to be uh, $1,200. I just turned your sprinkler knob. Yeah, my last one was, hey, man, like, I don't really want to touch them. But I'll, I'll adjust these ones, uh, you know, maybe 250 bucks. And I was like. I think I got it, man. Like, I'm just going to like make sure they're squirting the right way. <laughs> like no, nothing's broken. This is just like, Hey man, can we make sure the coverage is good? I just want to make sure they actually hit the glass, you know, like so no funny. joke. And I was like, wow, I'm in, I'm in Texas. This That's is savage, California. Dude. California. Like, I remember I had this lady that was so amazing. She was a house cleaner and she would come and she would deep clean for about $25 an hour. And she loved it. She absolutely loved it. And, here, yeah, it's like 75 bucks an hour. 
Wow, that is insane. That's, a that's big insane. Difference. That's yeah, legitimately it's, insane. It's pretty interesting. So uh, I'm excited for that trip, and I, I've been learning from each person. Some people I've been talking to have been to these countries. The jet lag. I'm trying to do everything that I can. I'm going with a three year old, so we'll see how much yeah. I can actually yeah. do on that. But I'm, be interesting. I'm pumped for for the travel. So you guys went from Bali. You guys did KL. You guys did all these different places, and then you guys did the travels in America. What tell tell me the difference? Cause I, I do think people need to know. There's a lot of people out there that maybe aren't connected to a church, and knowing what the difference is. You were connected, then you weren't. I'm sure you went to some churches on your in your travels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can't really get planted because you know you're not going to be there. What was it like to get planted? And also, you guys really feel called to where you're at. I think that's interesting, too, is like you have to make a decision a lot of times to get planted. Like Austin, I could have just kind of been wish-washy the whole time. Be like, well, maybe I'll live here. Maybe I won't. But like, I just decided when people ask me, do you like Austin? I'm just like, yes. But I decided when I moved here that I was going to like it. I wasn't going to look at all the negatives of it. You could look at the negatives of California state income tax, politics, prices, whatever. Uh, the list goes on <laughs> if you wanted to. It look does. At it goes on. Yeah. But when you're there, you're like, you can choose the people, the culture, the success, the church, the weather, the experiences. There's a lot of great things. So for you, what was the biggest difference between going from planted to unplanted to back to planted again? And how did you do it correctly? Because now you guys are planted well. Yeah, man. Yeah. I feel like God, you know, it really, it's really God just, you know, we, we, we prayed since we've been married to be planted in a, in a, in a great place that, that, that we wanted to be planted in. And, you know, so we have that in Chicago to an extent and, and we were grateful for that for sure. When we got unplanted, we started traveling. You know, I do think it was God. I think God wanted us here ultimately. And he knew to get me to San Diego, I wouldn't just go to San Diego because everything you said, income, state income tax, politics, like, are you kidding me? Um, you know, all the different stuff, right? He knew I wouldn't yeah. do it. So I think he needed to put me on that journey. And one of the side benefits was like my mind got opened in a lot of ways, um, just being overseas. And when we came back, it was God's way of like sending sending me over here. And I think Ashley would have been more immediately obedient to coming to San Diego and then getting rooted here is this, it was just, it was a very uh, interesting experience, but I was driving, we were driving from actually Texas. We're driving from Houston. We spent a month in Houston. Funny enough, the, one of the couples we met in Malaysia that gave us their penthouse for two weeks, gave us their Houston house for a month. Um, so that's kind of funny. So Smaller. we stayed in their Houston house for a month and we're driving, you know, across the country and we're driving into California and Brandon Elliot, uh, ca calls me and invites me to emerge, uh, which is the men's event and, uh, invites me to emerge. And while we're kind of on this, this drive, I don't know if he invited me yet or not, but I felt like as we're driving into California, God is like pounding in my chest, like, this is where you're supposed to be. And I want you to plant a church. And I'm like, it feels very clear. We probably all had those moments when we really feel God is speaking to you. I'm like, holy cow. And so Brandon invites me to emerge. I go. And as I'm at emerge, all the visions that we had of what we wanted in a church, it was like we had visions of men's ministries and what we would do there and all these things. And emerge was it. It was in my mind and in my heart. I'm like, holy cow. Like, my God, you didn't want me to plant a church. You just told me you wanted me to plant a church because, you know, I'm an entrepreneur and I want to go start stuff, but you don't want me to plant a church. You want me here, right? He's like, yeah, I wanted you here. And so we feel like a really strong call to be here. And we're very passionate about, you know, the, the move that's happening here. We're obviously very rooted in our church. And the difference is completely night and day. Um, and I feel like, you know, like we have, a, we have a great CPA and a tax attorney. They're both Christians. And um, both of them, of course, have said, hey, Zach, just so you know, um, this is how much you'd save if you just left California. And to both of them, but especially our tax attorney, I've said like, Hey, like you're not, I get it. And I want, yeah, I, I get it, but you're not, this is not an argument with me. Like you got to argue with the big guy upstairs. Um, and he's and he immediately just kind of, he's like, okay, dude, he's like, I get it. If God called you to do it, I understand. And as we've been more rooted here, we've seen more success in our relationships with friends, our church relationships, um, miracles in our own life. 
We've seen financial breakthroughs like year after year that we were not experiencing before that. And I really feel like we've attempted and tried to live under God's covering for, for our whole marriage and even before that. But I feel like there's a time when kind of like, you know, your attempts and God's actual covering like come over you. And, um, Correct. And, uh, and, and we definitely feel like that's there. And if we were to move out of that covering, like we would be just being disobedient. And even when you think about a lot of people, I talked about like with this show, even God and business together, and, and we're here building businesses and I'm showcasing a lot of that. Yet a lot of people look at them and they go, I need to move to California. That's the ticket. When the ticket was being obedient and obedience brought you to California. And I used to always describe California as like, even the tax one, what's more valuable to you. And a lot of times people look at money as like this most valuable thing. That's already the wrong way to look at it. Like if I was, if God told me to go back to California, I'd be in California in a second because of the feeling of being in his will is far surpasses. And the provision is so completely different than if you're just trying to penny pinch dollars, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Now, now in your decision-making process, you're looking at those things to be a smart steward and all that stuff. Well, I could have moved to Florida. I didn't have to move to Texas. I could have moved to any city in Texas. So there's like a lot of decisions that go into making the correct ones. And so I used to always say, you invest in masterminds. That's like the fee to be a part of California where there's heavy success, great culture, great weather, all of that. And it weeds people out. And mm -hmm. just that in itself, even if it wasn't where people are supposed to be or, or not, or the will, permissible, perfect any of that, it's still a very successful place that makes you more successful and oftentimes makes you more money than what it takes away. And, and I tr I've i always believed that. Everywhere I'd go, I'd, I'd have this crazy network. I mean, one of the biggest things I'm known for in my current friend group is the people I know. Well, it wasn't very hard when I was always around people everywhere I went, every cafe I went, every LA is right yeah. there. I was always connecting with them. And so I was yep. able to build that network that is so valuable. Why? Because I was willing to pay 13%, you know, and less property tax. Like here, it's crazy, bro. Yeah, dude, the property tax in Texas is gnarly. Yeah, but no state income. So you can choose to yeah, you can choose, choose to be in whatever type of house you want. You can live in a tiny house and pay less tax if you want. But we're looking at a new property and I was like, oh my goodness, this is hilarious, bro. It's like $44,000 of tax a year. <laughs> A property tax. Now you still have property tax in California, so you can't say too much. You have like what one one point two five or something? I don't even know. Um, I, I think you know, it's, we're like two point two one or I think something. It's point where seven at. five where we're at. Um, but oh, so like nice. when I was talking to like I was in Dallas for something, and I was talking to some lady there, and it was when everyone it was when everyone was like you know a lot of people were flooding into to, to Dallas and other places in Texas, and she was like, yeah, we're getting these Californians, and they think they can get like you know the same cost of they're like, Oh man, I'll come get a one and a half. Cause like, you know, a million in San Diego is like, if you buy the coast, you get, you got a shack. Right. So they're like, Oh, I'll bring a million or studio million. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. They're like, I'll bring a million and a half and I'll come by this cool spot in Dallas. And like, actually you won't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It'd be the equivalent of what they're seeing, you know, the interest rates and stuff, the difference really changes what your budget is. If, if you look at it like that as an entrepreneur, like I look at it so crazy because like we have higher interest rates right now. And so prices have gone down, not a ton, but like we're, people are also over buying houses or overpaying 50, a hundred K. So you take that out. Plus it's dropped from what they were actually being mm -hmm. listed for. So I look at this house and I'm like, if it got around this price point, I would buy it. But the payment would be just crazy that if you were a, just a normal person, meaning in mind wise, not money wise. Cause we know like even Brandon Elliott, like that kid had no money and now he's done a phenomenal job flipping his money and repeating it over and over yeah. again when it wasn't like he just had a bunch of money, but basically you do the math. It's crazy. Let's say a house has gone down to like 300 grand and you buy it now, but your payment is like way high. Like you're paying, let's just call it 50 grand more a year. Yeah. Let's just call it crazy. But let's say you do that for two years and you refinance at a good interest rate. Now, I'm not saying I don't even know what the interest rate would be in two years. But let's just say you do. You still saved 200 grand. Like you got the difference of mm -hmm. like people wanted the low interest rate with the high price house. So I didn't get locked at the interest rate. 
It's like, well, now there's the opposite where you can buy and, and refinance if you wanted to and buy at a cheaper price. And the difference there probably would be positive. Do your own research. But for me, I'm like, huh, I'm okay with that. Now I'm still trying to get another 20% off. Of yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, like I'm trying to make sure that that's definite. Like I want to win. It right. Back. Right. But that, that is a very interesting part of it. I, I would love for you to touch on something for me, which is, I haven't talked about with anyone. I don't think permissible and perfect will. I think this is interesting, right? Cause like, <laughs> there's a lot that goes into this, you know, it's like, a lot of times we want something, we believe something, we believe it's going to happen at a certain point, and there's times where it doesn't. And there's times where it does, and it does happen the way that we want. Because there's times where we declare and believe, and then there's times where we see what God's actually doing. You know, if God speaks to me and says, this is what I'm doing, well, then it's going to happen when he says it happened. If I say, this is what God said, who he says he is, I want this at this time, and I declare it, there's certain times where I have to trust that Hey, this is going to happen when it's, when it's supposed to happen. And when you guys moved to California, you guys are like, you entered into the blessing of the Lord through obedience. You look at Abraham, Abraham literally was obedient to exactly what God said, said he would sacrifice his son. Didn't have to God provided. And then it immediately was blessed. You look at uh, Joseph took a little bit longer, right? It's like, he had a dream, I'm going to rule over my brothers, and he went through this whole thing and then ended up doing exactly what God said. But many times on the other side of obedience is like this immediate kind of blessing and, and anointing and time where God calls you up. But when you're in the perfect will of God, like you experience it. Like I don't I don't know if Joseph was really – like he wasn't moping around, right? He, he it didn't go the way that I think he expected because he told his brothers, I'm going to rule over you. He didn't say, hey, I'm going to rule over you, but first you're going to – try to kill me but each place he was planted he was able to just prosper every single place that he was at almost like it was like perfect even when someone came to him with a dream he was able to interpret it and it was like that came at the exact right time and so i, I would assume that he kind of felt like god's with me right because he's seeing just the prosperity all around him even though he's in this jacked up place and at the very end he's like yeah this is how it was supposed to be the entire time I look at that and I, I see the obedience that you guys have had. And I think everyone would like that, right? Like there, where you guys live, California, there's the permissible will of God. Like you're able to do that. If I want to go eat at a dinner spot tonight, it's not like God's like, no, only this one, because this is the only one in my will. Now, sometimes probably, and I'd be happy with that. Tell me which spot you want me to go, Lord. And, and bro, like I literally, it, we just, a man and I went out for Valentine's day a while back. Notice how I say while back as well, because I don't know when the episode is going. <laughs> I just that in there for everyone. I go while back is like last week. And, and so I, I mean, I go out, but at, after we go out we go, I think we should go to this Austin proper hotel. It's very nice. And we are going to show up to it, dude. And I go to, I was going to Val Lakes, no parking, 42 bucks. I don't care who you are. I'm like, I'm about to go just step in this place and see what's going on. Like 42 bucks of LA. I'm like, let me drive around the block a couple times. <laughs> so finally, I'm like, whatever. I valet the car. We go in. We end up just having a dessert. And then we run into people that literally said if we weren't, like, the reason they went there is because they met us. And we were able to speak into these people and, like, be used by God in this moment. And it energized me. Because when you're in the will of God, it's energizing. Mm -hmm. When you see God moving, it doesn't matter what the circumstance is. As long as you see him doing things that you see the puzzle pieces, it's there. So it's like there are times where it's like, whoa, that would have never happened if I didn't go, if I didn't do, if I didn't go out, if I didn't stay out later. How like how do people walk in that like both sides? Did you think it was permissible? Did you feel like, hey, this is God's perfect will. He wants us here or planted like unpack it for me as best as you can for you guys. Yeah, man, for sure. Uh, I, I appreciate the question. By the way, I mean, I'm sure you've probably heard this before, but you know, we just love what, how you guys have shifted, you know, what, you know, like obviously uh, what you've been doing for years has always been incredibly use, useful and amazing and value giving and life giving to the kingdom. But just the fact that it's su there's such a focus on the kingdom now and, and on um, Christ and putting Jesus in front of people and, uh, and giving, giving what you guys are giving, we just absolutely love it. So I love that, like, we can be on this 
and like, you know, obviously we can talk about business stuff, which is great, but like, this is really like what we talked about before we started the kind of the fourth dimension, right? Like the, there's a the 3d, the three dimensions that everyone sees when we make decisions, but there's always, at least for us as believers is that fourth dimension underneath it. Like what was the driving, the driving force under it. And, um, I mean, I think, I think for, like when I was like, I don't know, somewhere in my teenage years, I just felt like, I just felt like the most important thing on earth was doing what God wants done, like doing what he wants me to do. And I just was, I always, I started to pray a prayer every day, almost every day where it was just, God, I'm God, I'm yours to command. And, and it was just like, show me what you want me to do. And I'll do that. And I just always wanted him to, to speak to me. And to me, it's just like that circum circumvented everything. It's like anything that I had a desire for, God, what do you want done? Like that ultimately, that's the trump card, right? And so it's just always asking him that. And so I feel like I would always ask him that. And I tr and it sounds a little hokey, but like even with the decision with like what you said at the, the restaurant with the valet and the, the dessert, it's like, you know, hey, God, what do you want done? Like, yeah, yeah, go in there, right? Or, you know, don't go in there. That's a story that you have with when you were younger and you're driving on the on the road and, you know, you, you feel like God's telling you to stay out later that night and, and you see that guy walking on the street, that whole really amazing yeah. story. But it's like, you're like asking like, God, what do you want done? What do you want me to do right here? And and I forgot to tell you, bro, that when I actually went to go get my car, the the valet, I even went to the restaurant. And I said, you guys validate? Because I'm like, I'm like that guy. <laughs> and they go, well, we take $5 off. And I'm like, okay, well, that's not that good. I go to get my car and they go, which one was it again? I go, that one on the curb. And they go, huh, they didn't put in the system. Here's your keys. Go for it. Like they just, I didn't pay. No way. They didn't want me to pay. They were like, we didn't put it in the system. So just, you're fine. Wow. And I was like, oh my gosh. Like, you know, like there's times where God shows up that way too, where sometimes I would have missed that because I was getting so logical in business. You know, sometimes you get so logical in business, you forget how to dream like a Christian and spirit-filled believer should because all your examples are these three-dimensional business decision makers that are logically going, well, they just messed up. That wasn't God that showed up or mm -hmm. you missed that. But like, you're, you, I just want to say that like we are a be, and then that happened. I was like, wow, I feel like an idiot. If I would have found a parking spot by just beating my head against the steering wheel, I would have never known that I actually got the parking for free. <laughs> so like I could have not driven the block and I still would have got it for free. Yeah, yeah. If I just would have shown up and thrown it in valet and said like, why are we here? Mm. God's going to well, provide. But yeah. we think like, oh, you know, I'm complaining. So keep going. Well, yes, we, we, you want, you were asking to be obedient over your own, over, over your own plans. Yeah. That's awesome, man. I'm glad you, I'm glad you showed that. Um, yeah, that's, 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 that's perfect. I think, um, I think there's, I think there's like two, like two facets to it, right? It's one, it's like, what, what is God calling me to do? And I feel like a lot of us who, a lot of people listening to this podcast, they're probably like, yeah, I feel like God has told me something, right? And I'm supposed to do something. And a lot of times we avoid it until hopefully he changes his mind. But I think we all find like not listening to God never turns out well, and he doesn't change his mind. You know, it's always just like, I'm just avoiding this. But so there's the... There's the like the concept of like, you know, speak it and speak it and believe it and, you know, claim it. Right. Uh, that kind of stuff. And and I'm, I'm a huge I'm a total believer in that. Like, I feel like God absolutely gave us the ability to, you know, pray for something that's in the desire of our heart. If the word says he gives us the desires of our heart. The word says that, you know, he'll guide our steps and direct our paths. Um, so I absolutely think that, like, you know, when I was 20 years old and, you know, uh, I said, hey, I want to you know, I want, I want to, I want to be a millionaire, right? I want to make a million dollars a year uh, in, in my own business. Like, I feel like God at that time, like, he's like, Hey, that is in alignment with what I wrote, right? That's an alignment with, with the things that are in my will. And yeah, absolutely. Like I'm going to send that to you. The part that I feel like a lot of us um, don't love is that he then puts us on a process that we have to go through ourselves. Like, you know, it's, it's that, that marriage of, speaking to the mountain, be cast into the sea. And then also then walking through that process of what it is like, you know, be cast into the sea poverty. But he's like, Hey, Zach, there's a lot of things that we need to like, you know, work through and beat out of you over the next, you know, 10 years. And, uh, and as we walk in it, 
I think we get closer and closer to the thing that he's like staked in the ground for us. Um, but I feel like, yeah, just for us, it's just been like in prayer. I mean, we, it sounds, and it doesn't sound hokey at all. Um, but like Ashley and I pray together multiple times a day, you know, we'll just stop in the middle of the day and pray for each other and with each other. It's not this long drawn out thing. Um, but it's, you know, one minute or so. Right. And we'll pray for each other. We'll pray for the day, pray that, you know, we have words to speak, ears to hear. And, um, and that just, we're just walking in what he wants us to do, that he directs our steps, he guides our path. And we know that he'll give us the desires of our heart. And, um, and we know that, you know, if, if he did tell us something like he's going to deliver on it and, um, and we just believe that. What's some of the craziest things that you've seen from that? Like doing that all the time. Like what are some, like obviously the, the pit not paying parking thing either way, even if I paid, I was still like, you know, well, God, you technically provided for that already too. Like, cause I can pay for the parking. So yeah. I kind of felt like an idiot anyway. Cause I was like, I know I'm supposed to be here. I feel like if I were to be like, God, how do you want your kids to show up here? It'd probably be in the valet. And I was like, okay, like he provided, that was a small thing, but it was recognizable. And he says, acknowledge me in all the thing in, uh, in all your ways, right? Acknowledge me in everything. And, mm -hmm. and what's so cool about that scripture is that it says that he'll make our path straight. And it says like basically making it straight and smooth. Like if you look at amplified of it, it says like he'll smooth the path. Another, another translation says that he'll crown your efforts with success. So it's like take your efforts and he'll crown them with success. And, and so even the tiny things, it's like that, but what are the things that you've seen, whether it be miracle or business or direction, or just like you felt like God spoke and then boom, like something crazy happened. Yeah, totally, man. Um, I feel like I, there's, there's three that come up immediately for me. Um, and so the, the first one is, is, is business related. And for the longest time, the, the, the number one thing I kept writing down, it was in like my affirmations, it was in the, the things I was praying for. It was, you know, I'm on a hundred thousand dollar a month business. Right. And we started to grow in that. And, um, and then, but as probably a lot of entrepreneurs, we we were battling with like refund rates, right? Like we didn't know how to, earn, we didn't know how to do the back end. We knew how to sell or we're learning how to sell, I should say, but we're like a lot of the back end stuff was like, Oh crap. And so we're battling refund rates and stuff like this. And so I changed it. I said, I want a hundred thousand dollar a month business uh, with a less than 1% refund rate. <laughs> You've got to be specific, right? Be specific, man. And so, um, and you know, and over like, I was praying for this for like 10 years, you know, from 20 to 20 or I guess eight years, 20 to 28 years old. And it's like, I'm basically from in those eight years, like basically zero progress happened, you know, <laughs> like uh, on the scale of zero to 100, it was like, you know, five, um, like five grand. And, uh, and then, you know, God's like, okay, hey, I'm, I, I'm the process that I wanted to take you through. It's now over. And like, like poof, snap your fingers and it's like poof, zero to a hundred. Like, Oh wow. That happened like way faster than I expected. And I actually forgot that I was declaring is actually, I was declaring a 2% refund rate. I forgot I was declaring that 2% refund rate. And I looked like six months ago. So I'm 34 now. So this whole story is like six years old, but I look like six months ago. I'm like, I wonder what a refund rate is. And it's less than 1%. And I'm like, wow. Oh God, Holy crap. Um, and then, you know, God's blessed, blessed us since then. But, um, another, there's another two quick stories that one is, is actually the house that we're in. So, um, we're, we have a super fortunate, we have seven acres on this property and, um, we're in San Diego and, um, it's pretty hard to find where you're like still in close access to a highway. You can get to beach towns, but you still have some space. And so we got this house, uh, during like the boom, right? When the housing prices were going insane, people were bidding, you know, hundreds of thousands over on everything. First bid, 200 grand over. I'm like, you guys are nuts. And we really felt like at the time, I was like, dude, we're not buying a house. Like zero chance because Grant Cardone said not to. And because <laughs> and we're just gonna buy all rentals, right? And so I'm, I'm kind of like thinking through this and I feel like even through like this cerebral version of like, we're not buying a personal residence, God's telling me, Zach, you're buying a house. 
I'm like, no, no, that, that doesn't wow. make sense, Scott. Like, here's all the reasons it doesn't make logical sense. And I'm buying an apartment complex this year. And he's like, hey, shh, shh, shh. Zach, you're buying a house. And I'm like, dude, just outside of you just saying so, which I started to believe that. And I was like, why? He said, Zach, because you have been, you have been nomadic for so long. And with all of the COVID stuff, um, California was uncomfortable. He's like, I don't want you to think it's so easy to leave again. He's like, your roots are staying because we were living out of a backpack for a year and a half. And so we could just throw our things in a car and roll out. And he's like, I called you to this church. I called you to this area. And I'm not going to take this whole like, you know, halfway and halfway out thing thing. So go buy a house. And we're like, bro. Okay. So finally we, we agreed, right? Like, okay, God, we're, we're going to do that. But then we enter into this bloodbath, right? Which obviously everybody here knows what happened for the past couple of years with housing, the housing world, housing values. I mean, even though there was an exodus out of San Diego, there was also an influx into San Diego from people in San Francisco and people swapping houses, interest rates being like 3%. People are upgrading things like this. So it's just a total bloodbath. And just how God provided for this place, we got this place in the middle of the heat. We got it under asking. Um, we got it at one third of our budget or one third of our stated budget, you know, per mortgage lenders, which basically tell you to be complete buffoons. Um, so basically one third of our approval rate under asking and, um, and God just like blew down these doors that everyone was battling with, but like people under the covering weren't, weren't. Um, and then just the more, another thing that's coming up. Before mind, you move on from that one, even what's interesting is there's something about grace like when you can hear from God, like you have grace for certain things and, and this will be a personal side of it. But like, I literally just got pulled over twice by the police and, and again, and I'm going to get chastised for this. So apologies in advance. And this is just my personal story and, and it's probably not even God speaking to me, but it, whatever. So I, I got a truck, right? Like a, a truck from a different state and they didn't ever ship me the license plates. And then they were supposed to, and then they ended up telling me to do it, and then I didn't do the have the right reporting. So I was driving around literally with no plates for months. <laughs> okay, I was traveling a lot. This is a California and, and thing, by the way, so I get it. I get it. Yeah, so it's like, and I I'll, in California, I drove around without plates for two years. Remember that? Yeah. And I never put plates on my Raptor, actually. You know, you convinced me to not do it. I drove around our that M5 for like nine months yeah. with no plates because... You know, and they didn't say anything. I got when right when COVID started, I parked in a spot and I got a, a ticket on a thing. And I basically sent a complaint into the state and said, like, do the DMVs are closed because COVID just started and they removed it. Yep. So that was the only time I ever got in trouble. So so there's grace on certain things. Right. So I'm driving and I don't feel like bad about it. And then one day I go out and I kind of feel like, hey, it's time like this needs to get done. And literally I get pulled over by a cop. And this is like months later. I've never been pulled over. And he goes, hey, man, just get it fixed. Like, no big deal. My wife goes out the next day. And I had a full day, so I couldn't get it done. And she gets pulled over again in my truck. And it was like, when I look at your guys' thing, you guys had an amazing rental. If you guys remember that first mm -hmm. one or whatever it was, like the, or the Oceanside one. You guys had that amazing rental, didn't work out, moved out. And then literally you moved into a horror nightmare place. Remember that one? <laughs> you, like had the dogs or whatever, and you had to move. And then you move to another one and it's almost like, you know, sometimes like this transitionary thing is like there's a grace for something for a season and then it kind of like rotates and it's like, hey, now it's time to go this way. You you may be seeing in relationships. It's cool to date. There's a season for dating. And then all of a sudden the grace gets stripped off dating. And if you don't enter into the new season or the next thing, then you start feeling like high and dry. Like, God, why, why have you forsaken me? I can't find a rental. It's like, yeah, because you're supposed to buy the property, dork. Like, right. you know, there's a little bit of that pushing. And so when I looked at mine, I was like, my grace kind of got taken. And, and after a while, it kind of seems like, you know, those things also made you more uncomfortable, right? You're like having to move. You moved into a place that sucked. And so, so and then now you guys have this awesome property and you have your second kid on the way. And it's awesome to have that. So I think yeah. that's, uh, yeah, it's cool. No, it's, that's a great, that's great. And it's so true too. Like, yeah, God constantly, the thing that's, I, I find completely mind blowing is that God always wants us to grow and progress and continues to lay out a new path for us. And this is like a dichotomy against the, like, uh, like basically like, 
a Buddhist type mental framework, which not that anyone is hardcore Buddhist on this, but like, I'll just tell you a, a, a quick version of my like really brief story. I'm a, I'm a pastor's kid, grew up in the church, basically go hardcore Christian for a long time. Um, I'm in the total frenzy of trying to build my our first business for eight years. And I get so burned out that I never leave the faith. I never leave God, never leave Jesus. But I start to ask myself, like, why have I done all of this? Like, why have I toiled and worked so freaking hard for like basically nothing? And so I started to really study like meditation and, you know, basically like accepting things that as they are. And, and so I, I learned how to be a lot more accepting of like, like, the path that I was on, but in, when you learn a lot about the stuff, you learn a lot about like, because, you know, clearly an, an, an enemy of, uh, of God, of Jesus is, is our culture. And, um, our culture really pushes a lot of the narrative of like, you know, Buddhism and, you know, taking things, um, like, you know, as they are and things like this. And basically one of the Buddhist teaching is like the, the root of all unhappiness is desire. Right. Which is if you just so that means if you desire something, you are making a contract with yourself to be unhappy until you get it. That's like what they teach. And in some ways, like it's very odd, like how I started to kind of like lean into not necessarily Buddhism, I'm using the extreme example, but I leaned into this like letting go. And the, the, the further I have gotten on in life, I realized like God does want us to release things. And he wants us to be content in all situations. Like Paul writes in Philippians, be content in all things, whether full or hungry, abounding or suffering need. And then that's when he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And he's basically saying like drive forward, but also be content. But there's this, um, there's this, like, I think poison that is like somehow sifting its way in through some of the church where, where, where is like, you know, Hey, Sarah, Sarah, you know, like, just let it, you know, just let it be. It's all up to God. And I can just kind of sit here and do nothing when in fact, God is saying like, you know, take ground, progress. Um, you know, Exodus tells us that the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. And the, the word says that he gives us the desires of our heart. And so to kind of what you said, when they, like God rotates and shifts things, I think God is always trying to get us to grow and to move forward. And to like take new ground, take new territories, always trying to like grow us into the next version of who he wants us to be. And when we try to like stay stagnant and like remove desire from our life and just become this like, you know, Zen Buddhist, like God's like, no, that's, that's not, that's not my will for you. Like, it's not what I want for you. And so if, I do feel like what you said. Have you seen any of Erwin McManus's stuff? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he, he gave this talk and I took notes on it and, and it reminded me of the, the Buddhist thing that he was like. Basically, I left this talk, and I don't, I don't think it's public to anyone, but, oh, this, we were together. Yeah. This is the, we were together yeah. on the call. It was that call that he did for Wellspring, and I remember literally leaving that call, and I was like, I'm a Buddhist Christian. I was like, this is terrible. Like, and, and he just talked about, like, that people are afraid of selfish ambition. Uh, we don't know what the Bible says. We know what people say about the Bible rather than what the Bible actually says. And he says, it says to be afraid of selfish ambition is something that people say. The ambition is selfless ambition. Ambition in itself is maybe not good, but selfless ambition is. And passion is essential in Christianity, but passion is evil in Buddhism. And he had talked about like, it was just really cool. When I heard that, I would love to hear that talk again. But I remember literally being on that call with you. And I was like, bro, I'm literally like, I'm like, need to repent for being a buddhist christian like, i was like totally like yeah. thinking a lot of those things that yeah. he had talked about and i was like wow like so, that was really really big yeah that, that was a very i totally forgot that we were both on the same call but yeah but uh at least for that specific instance and uh and yeah i, I want to get i actually wanted to come speak to the guys i think it'd be really good <sighs> what amazing. he said was like really phenomenal i don't want to take you off off your point number three though yeah the third story that's so amazing, dude. Yeah, Erwin's an incredible um, for anyone that checks him out. That's so true, dude. And if you can get him, that'd be so cool. Um, uh, the, thir the third one is, is, is just, oh, I was, I was at a men's prayer. And I was, and, and I think you, you, you obviously, like you, you and I have been to the same men's prayer quite a bit. And basically there's like, you know, there's like 
200 guys in this room at super early in the morning on a Tuesday morning. And our church does this men's prayer every week. So it's like not the men's prayer that I would have thought, like we're all sitting around in like folding chairs, you know, like singing uh, hymns or something. And it, it used to be 15 to 30 guys, bro, for the whole time, like for the first couple of years that I was there, it was literally in the living room, 15 to 30 guys for two hours, 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. One hour of God stories, one hour of prayer. There we go. You're like, a, yeah, you're OG, man. So now it's too, it just shows how cool that is though, that now there's 200 that's in like one location. There's multiple yeah. locations of this happening now Yeah, where these guys are getting together from five thirty to seven, I think it is now. Yeah. Yeah. And it's obviously different because you can't, you know, have 200 people do the same thing as 20, but the, the, the whole premise. So keep going. You're in this prayer group and it's like 200 yeah. dudes, Yeah, not so. in folding chairs, lawn chairs, not, not cooking raw steaks over a fire and, and having a Bible study, but even though that'd be pretty cool. That would be pretty cool. That sounds pretty sweet. Um, and we break up into our groups and there's, you know, four or five of us in a group and I pray for this guy. He's praying for, um, he's praying for, <clears throat> oh my gosh, I'm forgetting the details of, of, oh, he's praying for his, 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 his daughter, his wife is pregnant with his daughter. And, and his wife and the, and the daughter is like, you know, got some severe sickness that like might, might not make it through pregnancy type of thing. So we pray and, um, we move on. Right. And so it's literally a year later and I'm sitting in a church service and there is like one of those video testimonials where someone has this, you know, radical encounter with, with Jesus and it's a video testimonial and it goes through the whole thing. And, and the guy is telling this story and he's up on screen and he said, so my wife gets pregnant with our daughter and a, a few months into pregnancy, the, the baby contracts this crazy thing, this crazy condition where it's, it's highly unlikely that she's going to live. Um, the daughter's going to live. It's not threatening mom and they're needing to go to this doctor in San Diego, they live up in North County. And so they're needing to travel like 45 minutes down to San Diego three times a week for ultrasounds and for this other type of treatment. They're going all the time, three times a week for like six months and getting ultrasounds, getting these treatments, things like, and it's not getting better. It's not getting better. It's not getting better. But the, you know, daughter of course keeps on, you know, like not, not passing away. They're telling her to, um, unfortunately, you know, Hey, they're not, basically telling her, Hey, you, you probably want to just abort this child. And you know, that kind of thing. Um, they're not going to do it. And all the way up through giving birth, the, the, the condition is still there. Um, I think in some of the middle parts, like even some of their, they couldn't find some of her limbs being developed properly. And so it's time where they're about to, you know, give birth and they're still saying a lot of the same stuff. Like, Hey, if you give birth to this child, it's, like basically impossible that she's not like severely handicapped in in many ways. Um, they go through with it. They, you know, she delivers the baby and the baby is completely and totally healthy in every way. The baby's out of the womb now. Um, she's now like at the time of this video, the baby's like six months old or eight months old or something like that. Baby's totally healthy, totally normal, has all of her limbs, all of her faculties, you know, everything that a healthy child would do, everything that the mom would do. And the guy is telling the story. He's like breaking down and crying. Uh, I mean, how could you not? He's breaking down and crying. And he's like, he's telling the story about Adam men's prayer. Somebody prayed for him and, and that there was, uh, there was, there was these golden hands that were holding his child and that his child was covered and his child was being developed and God was still, still knitting her together. And as the first moment, like, I didn't even recognize the dude, but like when he said that, like it all connected, I'm like, holy crap, dude. I, I'm like, just break down and start crying. And like, you're just like crying so hard and weeping. Cause I was like, that was me. Like I prayed for that guy. And you know, I don't even know who he is to be honest. Like, I don't even know the guy's name. He goes to another campus and stuff. Um, but I remember earlier, like I started, cause now you start to like line everything up. And I remembered earlier, I was praying like, God, like, like, show me, show me visions, show me, like, show me what you want me to say. Like, 
I feel like you want me to prophesy over people. You're trying to show me these pictures and these dreams and like, just show me that Lord. And so a few weeks later, he started to show me that. That's when I prayed that, like the golden hand thing obviously has nothing to do with me. It's everything to do with God, but God showed me this golden, that golden hand picture. And I, I, I shared it with the guy and then that story unfolded, like I said, and ever since then, God has been like, and it's not like on command. It's not like a magic trick I can just pull out, but you know, he'll show me these things and he'll be like, Hey, you know, here's this, or here's this, or here's this. And to me, that's just like, I know those are kind of three very separated types of experiences, but um, to me, it's just like to watch God move in the financial, in the physical, and then in like this miraculous, you can't describe it type of thing where all the doctors are telling you, your daughter is going to have no limbs. <laughs> your daughter has this crazy blood thing that she's going to die, might even kill mom. And then to like pray, and like God speaks through your mouth and then it literally happens like that. And you're like, holy cow. Um, just the power of God is, is absolutely amazing. But this is interesting. This is like how it's supposed to be. And this is why I think it was so important to launch God's business is because peeling back the layer, how do we make these decisions? How do we act differently? And as a spirit filled believer, you look at the difference when the, when the disciples were following Jesus and then Jesus says, no, it's better that I go. One of my friends, Chris Kildosher, he said something so profound about this. He said it, people think it's so that you'd see signs, wonders, and miracles, but it actually was even more like the greatest gift wasn't just the miracles or the authority. It was the power through the Holy spirit because the, the signs, wonders, and miracles, every healing, all these other things, they, they were, they were happening before, right? Like God had healed people. God had, like cleanse people, it could still happen. But it was like the Holy Spirit was this powerful thing. You see the difference in the disciples. And this has been kind of my, my kind of my, what I want to experience inside of King's Brotherhood. And, and through this show and showcase is that when they got filled with the Holy Spirit, they knew how to make decisions. They not only walked in power and authority, I mean, everywhere they went, their shadows were healing people, right? It was just like the culture they were walking in was just like, just imagine everywhere you walk, you know, you're just like, Phew people getting healed of everything and and then the decision making right they were adding thousands to the church daily there was a very big difference in the way that they made decisions and acted and this is an example of that as well is that that the normal people would have said make these decisions do these things and no one would have even known they would have just thought we made a wise decision right wise decision based on the world yet how do we access that inside of the companies that we're building our relationships that we have the people that we're interacting with what are the things, where can we hear from God in those areas? And also in the, inside the miraculous, I think that's just, it blows my mind because of how different it is. I, I talked about, uh, even Bray and Kalen, when we first met, like we met and went to dinner and Kalen got instantaneously healed of a chronic rheumatoid arthritis that she'd had, like Brandon had to cut her food at dinner because her arthritis was so bad. And instantly healed, never had a problem. That's how we became friends. We were like, oh, like you guys friends because of business or whatever. It's like, no, it was Jesus, but it was one step further. Like we saw God miraculously heal her at dinner and like their decisions that they make is all based on that. Like, and I know for you guys, you wake up every day and probably like, God, like speak through me, get f direct the, the things that I'm doing. You're claiming promises. And that's how we're. We're truly finding the path. And then we're building the frameworks, of course. Like, I think it's interesting how Solomon, he always, like, when he needed a bronze worker, he found the best guy mm -hmm. and brought him in. Like, a logical guy. Like, we know how to run events. Like, I, we built the framework. But, like, how we got there and, like, the things behind it that matter, the tactics are phenomenal. And that's why I don't want to separate it, right? Like, faith and business. Yeah. The tactics are absolutely necessary. I literally... I've hired Brandon. I'm like, Brandon, I need help. Like, I, I need, I need to know how to do this. Yet the o overarching theme of how we're running everything, making decisions, mm -hmm. man, like how you can't, w you can't worldly knowledge or worldly wisdom, a, a baby being completely healed. <laughs> you can't, right. You can maybe with a business. Yep. Here's your investment strategy. Do the Buffett investment right. strategy. Cool. That's a very wise thing that works in that. But like even my property, like I flipped a property here. I've got paid $22,000 a month or something like that 
to like maybe a little bit more, but like twenty two grand a month of my profit for enjoying a little cabin on a lake for eleven months. And it was not a smart investment strategy. It just wasn't. Or else everyone would have fought for it. Yeah. But it wasn't really supposed to be like this great investment strategy, but we felt God say, This is the one. Mm -hmm. And we walked on the land and we kicked the dirt and we were like Seems like good dirt. Pretty, pretty good. Yeah. And it ends up being this like crazy investment, you know, like, whoa, like three X. I have like $120,000 into it and got $353,000 out. Yeah. In 11 months. Yeah, that's incredible. Why? Because God spoke and said the righteous possess land. In, in not like spoke to me directly, someone read the scripture from Psalms. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't possess anything. I'm like, I don't think this is good. So I started looking for like little 10 acre lots around here. And there was all these great logical ones. And I was like, they're ugly. I don't like <laughs> and then we found this one and it wasn't logical at all. But it's like the voice of God, like man doesn't live off bread alone. Mm -hmm. But every word that comes out of the mouth of God, it's like written word and the spoken word that mm -hmm. he speaks to you. And man, it's just, uh, I love the wisdom on that. And again, I'm really big on mentors community mm -hmm. confirmation you know yeah god speaks through confirmation it's confirmed by other people all that good stuff but i'm also not okay like not going after it and i, I just appreciate you sharing that so if you could for me and for everyone listening i would love for you to pray for everyone uh that that's that's listening and i think that part of it would be that god would open up the the how he says he'll direct our paths like that he would direct open up what that will is for the people listening. And also uh, with that miracle story, if you could just release uh, around kids healing and, and wombs being opened, those yeah. two things would be phenomenal. And your wife's like about to give birth. So it's perfect. Dude, it's wombs open, it's kids being in perfect health and, and knowing the will of God. Dude, I love it, man. Absolutely. God, we just thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you so much for all that you've given us. We thank you for every person listening right now we thank you where they're where they're at whether they're driving whether they're sitting they're standing and we just thank you for them and their families we thank you for nicholas and amanda and kingston and their family as it continues to blossom and we thank you for giving us words to speak and thank you for giving us ears to hear and we thank you for directing our steps we know that you that you direct our steps as we walk you don't always give us uh 20 steps but you sometimes just give us one God, we thank you that uh, just as the Israelites came out of Egypt and they didn't know where to go, that you you led them uh, through the night, through the day with the pillar of fire and the pillar of smoke. And that when they were in the season, when they just needed to be provided for day by day, that you gave them you gave them food day by day. You gave them manna day by day. That's all you wanted to give them, not, not five days, just one day. And God, we know that the next season is one of wealth creation, that sometimes just day by day, but as they entered into the promised land, they got land that would that would generate massive wealth for them. And we thank you for that as well. Regardless of the season that someone is in, we just thank you that that their faith continues to grow. Thank you for taking their seeds and compounding them and pressing them down, shaking them together and pouring them back to them. And thank you for rebuking the devour from their life so that you'd open up the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing. There's not room enough to receive it. Can we pray for anyone listening right now that that hasn't accepted you as their Lord and Savior? God, we just pray that um that that they do. We just, uh, we thank you for allowing us to repent of our sins. Thank you for healing the rift between sin and death, for healing the rift between sin and death and you. And God, we just uh, pray that uh, they would call on you and that uh, they would ask you to enter into their life and enter their heart as uh, as our Lord and Savior. Yeah, we speak to anything that is uh, sick or diseased or any illness or any diagnoses that are inside of any of the uh, the men or inside of the women or the children that are under the sound of my voice and we speak to any sickness or disease and we speak to you and we say that you have no place here the word says that these signs would follow those who believe in my name they would cast out demons they would speak in new tongues they would lay hands on the sick and they would recover and so god just like you cast a shadow off peter and that people were healed we pray that you right now that you touch the people that are listening that you heal any sickness or disease inside of them that they would go home today and they'd be instantly and miraculously healed. There's no explanation for it other than your healing power, other than your touch on them and their life. Can we pray that you, that you touch the wombs, Lord, that you touch the wombs right now, that if they were closed, that they are now open, they're miraculously opened in Jesus name. That if there has been a struggle for kids, if there's been a struggle for children, 
whether it's the first one, the second one, the third one, or the fourth one, God, we know that you told us to multiply. You told us to reproduce. You told us to expand your kingdom on this earth. And so, God, we pray for a complete restoration inside of the men's bodies, a restoration inside of the women's, and we speak to the wombs now and we command them to be open in Christ's name. We pray if there's any sickness inside of the children, the children in, in the families that are listening to this right now, we pray that they are healed. Pray that there is a touch of God on them, that their mind is restored. I feel like autism is a thing that people are, are, are scared of, that there's are worried about their children not thinking clearly or not being not being where they want them to be. So God, we just speak that they are healed, they are restored. They're made exactly as you've designed the perfect humans, God. We pray that their bodies are aligned, that their mind is aligned, their spirit is with you. And we pray that every single child, every single child that is in the families of the people listening now, that they grow up to be men and women of God and they never depart from your way. And God, we love you. And we say these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I appreciate it, man. And thanks for coming on the show. Amen, dude. Absolutely. It was my pleasure. And thank you for having me, bro.